ESPN 1410 Wing AM brings you 1410 Wing Live. Follow along on Facebook, on Twitter, even on our ESPN Dayton YouTube channel and at wingam.com. We're everywhere. The biggest interviews with the biggest local and national guests. It's 1410 Wing Live with Justin Kinner. 1410 Wing Live, Justin Kinner with you here. I hope all of you are having a great day, and I'm excited uh, to bring you another edition of 1410 Wing Live, including our next guest. He's a Hall of Fame writer. He works with The Athletic, and his name is Jason Stark, and he's good enough to join us here today. Jason, welcome in, sir. How are you? Justin, hanging in there, man. How are you? Good. I don't know what the weather's Are you in Philly? Is that where you were at? I am. Yep. Yeah. It's pouring down rain here. It's been horrible out, so <laughs> hopefully the weather's better for you. I mean, it's not raining, but it's been a poor excuse for a spring. Exactly. <laughs> All right. A lot to get into with you. I appreciate you taking time and hanging out with us here uh, this afternoon. We're going to get into your podcast coming up here in just a minute because I just actually caught the latest edition of it and really good stuff in there. Talks about the last dance. So we'll get to that coming up in a moment. But what's on the minds of everyone right now is, of course, the ongoing baseball negotiations right now, Major League Baseball. What's the latest that you're hearing from that? And are we getting any closer to a potential 2020 Major League Baseball season? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say there's been any progress really on any front. Um, as you know, the, uh, the owners, Major League Baseball, presented a 67-page report uh, health and safety protocols to the players over the weekend. Uh, my understanding is the union is is going through that. It, it's amazing that it's got so much detail, and yet there are so many more questions that have to be answered. But that's where they are on that front. And then on the economics, baseball still hasn't made a proposal, despite all you've heard about that 50-50 revenue mm -hmm. split that was in the news last week that never got formally proposed. I personally think they will find a way to work through both of these, but there are huge challenges. What are the biggest challenges? I mean, right now, I think what's out there the most is, and it's unfortunate, but like the, the two comments made last week, I mean, heading into last weekend, you know, Blake Snell and then Bryce Harper, you know, re-commenting on his comments. That was kind of the main, you know, that, that's where a lot of the attention was going heading into the weekend. Is it fair? I mean, I, the players are being deemed the bad guys in this, and I don't think that's completely fair because I don't think I even know all the, the background information, so it's easy to deem them as selfish. I don't think that's fair. W what is their main takeaway of this? I know it's easy to just say money, but why are they finding this so unfair when everyone else is like, hey, we've all taken a hit during this. Why are they excluded from that? What, what's the real story? Yeah, I don't think it's completely fair either. Um, I, you know, I just think it's a bad idea to have – out in public right now in the middle of a pandemic with 36 million people unemployed like that that's just a horrible look and uh you know that that that's that's part of their perception issue right now but in terms of actually trying to find a way to make a deal you know the the owners decided to present this 50-50 revenue split i i think knowing there was no way that the players would buy into it or even want to engage in a conversation about it. And, you know, it's, it's funny. I've, I've covered baseball for a long time, covered way too many labor squabbles. And it, I, I say all the time, if you, like, if you were a Martian and you just landed on earth and you're just examining this whole proposal, you'd have owners saying, Look, we don't know how much revenue there's going to be. You don't seem to believe us that we're going to lose it. So why don't we just count it up at the end and whatever we count, you can have half of it. Like the Martians would say, sure, that sounds fair. But if, you, if you're familiar with this sport and these two sides and their history, you'd know if you're an earthling that this was not leading anywhere. And so... I, I think they will find a middle ground, but don't ask me what it is because right now they're nowhere on that side of it. When you look at the some of the other sports out there, the NFL is not fair to talk about now because they're still months away from even having to make a decision like what baseball has or even basketball. But the NBA seems different. It seems to have full support from the players. Why is there, and again, I know you Major League Baseball, but why why is there seem to be less bumps in the road for the NBA, more support from the players to come back than in baseball? Is it a different cap structure that's leading to that, in your opinion? 
well, they're two totally different economic structures, but mm. I, I think the fundamental difference between the NBA a, and every sport is Adam Silver just has it figured out. He has enormous trust among players, credibility among the public, and like they can find a path forward based just on Adam Silver's wisdom and trust factor. Whereas in baseball, they fight about everything. Uh, I mean, it's been going on for way too long, but there's just no sense of trust or common purpose between the two sides, between Rob Manfred and Tony Clark, between the union and Major League Baseball. And that's just that just creates a bumpy road, and you're feeling every bump right now. Yeah, and, you know, in the NBA, you see, like, LeBron James and Steph Curry, Kawhi Leonard, they come together, and they're calling players-only meetings, and, and they're very rah-rah, very positive, which that's great for them. You just don't see that from baseball. You don't see the stars of the game be very outspoken too often. I know there was a clip from, uh, you know, Bryce Harper last week, but you just don't see Major League Baseball players come together like that like you see in the NBA. Yeah, I think most players want to play. They're very motivated to play to, and find a way to play. but. Um, baseball, look, there are a lot more baseball players, for one thing. Uh, the stars don't have the same presence. That, that's another thing. Mm -hmm. And there's just more division. Uh, I don't think there is one common view by baseball players right now. You have a group that just want to play. And then you have a group of – you have guys who have proven health issues who are at risk – uh, they have great concerns about whether it's safe. Uh, you have the Blake Snells who don't think the m whole money thing is fair. You've got agents. Scott Boris has been heavily involved, and you know he's trying to take the position that there's nothing to even talk about here. So, like, think about where we are in general. They just did an agreement a few weeks ago. Now they can't even agree on what they agreed on. All right, we have Jason Stark with the Athletic Hall of Fame writer with us here on fourteen ten. Wing Live. Uh, so I just caught uh, the latest episode of Starkville. I saw that you tweeted that out just a little bit ago as well. And uh, the last dance, I know it's, uh, it's you know, but Michael Jordan, the Bulls, NBA, but I just think it's a fantastic sports documentary at that. So much you could take away about all sports from it. But I got to thinking about baseball. And in your latest Starkville podcast, you guys talk about, you know, which players, past or present, could, you know, make a great, you know, the last dance documentary. You mentioned a name that I never really considered, but Barry Bonds is a very interesting name when you consider his career path and kind of the fallout from his career. Yeah, and I, you know, I mentioned Barry because uh, I've been, I've been mesmerized by Michael. You know, hey, Michael's genius, uh, his presence, his greatness, his passion to be great, and everything that went with that. And, you know, I just can't think of many baseball players – in my time that have had that kind of hold on the public. And I mentioned Barry Bonds because I'm reading uh, Joan Ryan's great book about team chemistry called Intangibles. And she talks about Barry and Barry had that, that genius talent and that arrogance and that confidence about him that Michael had, even though they're com two completely different people. And, you know, I, I think at a different time and place, Barry could have been a great, subject for a documentary like that the only other player that i can think of that was that great a source of fascination among millions of people for many years is pete rose uh, you know, i know that's a name that people in ohio are familiar with um i don't know if you could possibly do a pete rose last dance first dance any kind of dance but boy there's a lot there yeah, especially when you tie it in with the Big Red Machine. I mean, just very similar to the Bulls and MJ. You had that that right. popular player with the you know, star team around him, the Big Red Machine, Pete Rose. I think it would be a fantastic documentary as far as that's concerned. When I emailed you earlier, I, I did make sure to put in there. I was like, but there might be a, a – I, I sense there's a Pete Rose fatigue amongst baseball fans because Pete Rose, about once a year we get into the Hall of Fame conversation and then it dies out. There might be – I think what made the MJ documentary so unique – is that you don't see MJ in the media. He doesn't do interviews. Uh, it was rare footage. You hear Pete Rose too much sometimes. You see too much of him. Barry Bonds, to your point, too, is very similar to MJ in that regard. You don't see him do interviews. You don't see him in the media often. Very quiet, very private person, which makes those types of shows so unique for individuals like that. Yeah, that's a great point, Justin. Um, 
you know, I think the problem with Pete Rose is it's been basically the same conversation for how many years now? And a uh, like a look back at everything that went into Pete's career, uh, the teams he played on, and then everything that happened after he stopped playing, uh, like that would be different. That would be a much different plot line. It would all revolve around gambling and the Hall of Fame, but there, there are a lot of levels to Pete. And, you know, as somebody who has known Pete for many years, I, I, I used to think for a long time that Pete was the all-time lightning rod player where you, you could always write about him. You could always talk about him on any talk show. And uh, I don't know, could, does that mean you could always do a documentary on him? Uh, it, it's amazing that nobody's found out. Houston Astros, obviously a big topic of conversation this past season. Speaking of Pete Rose, it led to him saying, well, hey, you know, look at what they were a part of, the cheating scandal, but yet all they're getting is a slap on the wrist compared to his, you know, lifetime banishment from the sport. What was your takeaway on that? We've talked about Pete in the past. You shared the story of how he blamed you at one point, right? He blamed you for why he wasn't in the Hall of Fame or, or something along those lines. But Pete Rose, just fascinating. But when he came back into the news after the Houston Astros stuff, some people said he made some valid points as far as that's concerned. Yeah, or just quickly, the uh, the connection between me and Pete not getting into the Hall of Fame. If you remember after the All-Century team, uh, Pete got the big re reception at the World Series. And there was momentum that kind of got built up toward maybe him, some kind of compromise where he could be reinstated to at least get on the Hall of Fame ballot. Joe Morgan and Mike Schmidt and Pete went to Milwaukee met with Bud Selig, had what they thought was a productive meeting. And then a couple things happened. One was Pete left the meeting, went right to a casino. So that got everybody all worked up. But the other thing was I found out about it. I was working at ESPN at the time, uh, wrote about it, reported on it, went on TV and talked about it. And it changed the whole conversation. Uh, it just reignited all the same old stuff, all the baggage. And uh, Bud just got squeamish. And then it just never advanced and, Pete released that book, Hall of Fame Week. So th there was all of that. Um, now to fast forward the question about whether the Astros scandal should change the conversation about Pete Rose. Um, I, I, I honestly think they don't have a whole lot to do with one another. Uh, you know, there are, there, there are always going to be questions now about the Astros, just the, just the way there are always going to be questions about Pete his motivations of gambling colored uh, just so many of his actions as a manager and potentially even as a player. And there's always going to be questions about the Astros, what they did, how they did it, whether we should look at the, the world series they won and all the games they won, the, the achievements and take them as real or something that deserves some kind of asterisk. But I, I don't actually get the, connecting of the dots between Pete and the Astros. You can feel free to explain it to me if you want. Comparing illegalities, it's always the, well, he got away with it. How come I can't type the deal? So, there you go. Jason, I'll send you off with this. One thing that's been fascinating, of course, when we talk about the Hall of Fame, um, and I'm going to congratulate you here in a moment on your induction last year, just uh, in a moment on that, but you always have been one of the few writers out there that have continued to voice your support for a Roger Clemens or a Barry Bonds. What is it about the way you vote that you're able to overlook some of those deficiencies throughout their career that maybe other writers can't. I don't know. If support is the right word, Justin. I do vote for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't, I wouldn't say I feel good about it, but he, you know, here's the problem that we run into as voters. People tell me all the time, keep all the cheaters out of the hall of fame. And you know what I tell them? How? Like, mm -hmm. please, Give me a list of everybody who cheated, and I'd be happy to vote that way. The problem is that for that generation of players, until we got into a period where there was extensive testing and suspensions, um, we're just guessing. And it's become a giant guessing game that we continuously get wrong. We, I don't think there's any doubt we've already elected players into the Hall of Fame who did something, used something cheated. And so I, my feeling is I, I think the Hall of Fame needs to be a history museum. I think we should elect the greatest players of that era and let the Hall, 
with the people in Cooperstown, try to figure out what's the best way to explain it or put their achievements in perspective. Maybe even the same with Pete Rose. Pete Rose got more hits than anyone who ever lived, but he also did this. Barry Bonds hit more home runs than anybody who ever lived, but um, that's what I would like to see happen because we're just not good at doing it the way we're doing it. All right, Jason, this will be the last thing. You were inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 2019. Timing's everything. In fact, I just spoke with Marty Brenneman, uh, you know, Hall of Fame voice of the Reds a few weeks ago. I said, man, I'm so glad you retired uh, last season and weren't holding out for this season because it would have just been a mess. And I'm so glad that you got inducted in 2019 as opposed to this year so you could be a part of the ceremony and everything. Congratulations on that. I know that was a huge accomplishment for you. I've seen a lot of your interviews, you, you know, commenting on that. What a special accomplishment. And again, congratulations on that. Justin, I appreciate that, man. And uh, like in my house, we talk every day about how lucky we were that my year was last year. I really feel for everyone mm -hmm. who was supposed to be honored this year, and that's not going to happen until 2021. What a shame. All right. Well, Hall of Fame writer Jason Stark with The Athletic, MLB Network. I uh, really appreciate your time this afternoon. Always great catching up. Thank you. Continue to stay safe to you and your family, and I uh, appreciate the time today. Thanks so much, Justin. Be well, my friend. Absolutely. And there you go, Jason Stark. Good enough to join us here today on 1410 Wing Live. And I appreciate everyone taking time and hanging out this afternoon. we got the Justin Kinner Show coming up at 3 o'clock. Uh, we'll re-air some of this interview coming up during the show. Plus, we'll get into more of the Last Dance conversation and more. Until later this afternoon, this has been 1410 Wing Live on wingam.com.